different um, things this evening as part of our study session. We will begin with the superintendent's report. Just so everyone is aware, we don't typically live stream our study sessions. We are live streaming. We do have the link available. Um, we also have our other public comment means of communication that has already been shared with the community. So the first way is through our typical uh, board link. And there is one comment there that came in that I'll read when we get to our place of public comment. We also have the other link that we were utilizing for the community forum. We also have index cards. If you would prefer to write a question, and as always, you're also able to make a comment or ask a question in person. Mr. Muller will um, take a microphone and we'll be able to give you access to the floor when that time comes. Um, also, I just wanted to introduce some members that we'll be including. So I am listening and our board is listening to the feedback from our community, having additional questions about the data that we're using in order for the board to make the very best decision that they can. Um, last week, you met Mr. Anthony Colstock from Crabtree Rohrbach. This evening, we're joined with um, Dr. Fred Witham, who is a data analyst for Crabtree Rohrbach, prior superintendent, has been through this process. Uh, so I appreciate you being with us this evening, Dr. Witham. And also on Zoom, we have Ron Van Orden, who is the vice president of enrollment analytics for Decision Insight, which was what the company, he works for the company, um, that the board had partnered with back in June 2021 to begin this, this data collection. Um, so we do appreciate your comments. We hope that this evening when we have all of the data um, gurus in the room that they can explain and go into more detail uh, to enable the community to feel more comfortable with the data that we're sharing with you. Um, so at this time, I would like to turn it over to Ron if he is available on he is not yet available. Okay. He disappeared. He came in and then he left. So we'll see if he doesn't join back up here momentarily. In the meantime, we can shift. I'm assuming let's go directly into public comment. Um, so if we have any members of the community who are interested in asking questions at this time, we can go ahead um, and do that. And then I'll read a couple of the online. One and you have one. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Good evening, everyone. We have a public comment from the last meeting. Meredith Miller, I believe Hamilton Township, correct? At a previous meeting, it was shown that the max borrowing amount for the projects is 100 million. It looks as though for the budget for option two is well over that. Option three is close as well especially with many costs not being factored in yet. Is this correct? Also, is the entire project being funded by borrow funds or was anything set back to go towards it? And are there any possible grants or ESSER money that could be put towards, for instance, the upgrade of the HVAC system in option one, if that were chosen? That was from the last meeting. Did I get that right, Meredith? Yeah. Okay. Repeat the last part of that question. The last part? Are there any possible grants or ESSER money that could be put towards, for instance, the upgrade of the HVAC systems in option one? Um, I'll leave that question to the district with the ESSER funds if you've already used those or you would plan to use it in a renovation. Project. Right. Yeah, I can speak to the ESSER funds at this time. Um, the ESSER funds have been allocated. Um, those funds, there's ESSERS 1, ESSERS 2, ESSERS 3. So all of those monies through 2024 have been allocated. Uh, and then as far as grants, uh, sometimes um, when the state has the budget for it, uh, we do encourage districts that we work with to pursue certain grants, um, either like a RACB grant or uh, through the... Um, Thank you. Um, through the uh, uh, economic development, through the Commonwealth, uh, those are always options. And as the, the question, the first part of the question, I think, was in regards to the amount of the budget compared to the estimate. Yes, the option two um, was 
close to or exceeded $100 million. Uh, I mentioned at the meeting last week that site construction was not included in either of those options. Um, and then uh, it, sometimes districts will use all the money that they borrow um, to fund the project. Other times districts will use capital reserve fund or monies from their fund balance to also support the budget uh, if it's if it's in addition to what their borrowing capacity is. So does that, does that answer your, your question? Well, you say sometimes, but in this instance. That's up to the that's up to the district how they would as far as how much they would borrow and then how much they would use of their own money that they currently have within their within their fund balance. This is Duncan. Okay. Um, I think Meredith, I answered your question with um, I sent you the copy of the uh, calculations from PFM. So those were the official calculations of our borrowing capacity. So then what they do is they take the current debt that we have subtracted, and that gives us what we're available at this point in time. So what was available at this point in time is like 104.5 million. So what happens is one, any project that we would do would be over time. So just like when you have a line of credit, when you pay down your line of credit, and your, or your home value increases, your, your borrowing capacity would increase. So over the length of these, any of these projects would be anywhere from six to seven years, uh, the borrowing capacity would be there for any of the projects that the district would uh, plan to do. Does that answer? <laughs> <laughs> is there something more that you I don't understand? Not or? at the moment. Okay. I, don't know. I think that the information I sent you was pretty clear. I emailed you the answer. I sent you the document. And I sent that question last week okay. prior to emailing okay. you, but part of my question okay. hadn't been answered or right. asked. I mean, is I that know, sufficient? So. Did, was the explanation what you needed? I guess, to, sure. Okay. I mean, I guess, you know, what the reality is or what will actually happen. I mean, obviously none of us know what is going to happen. Correct. And we don't know what the rates are going to be. We don't know Correct. how long the project's going to take. We don't actually know the cost of things that far down the road. Um, I guess we all just want a, a magic ball to tell us what's gonna happen, yes. you know? And um, it's hard for us to be comfortable with a large amount of money, you know. Um, so, yes and no, <laughs> you know. Thank you. Okay. Um, I do have one public comment that made its way. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Sure. Um, on to our board public comment link. This is from Kimberly Topper. After reading in the Gettysburg Times the options for the district renovations, my question as a taxpayer that feels that the school tax is already a burden on property owners, what increase does this renovation mean for the school tax on the district property, owners, renters, businesses? Inflation and increasing prices are hitting hard enough. People can't afford to be hit in the wallet with the burden of paying for more school tax. That was my question, and that one was from the game. That was before you sent me the link last week, and I watched it. I guess my question right now is, you know, and I think it's everybody's kind of question here. People cannot afford to continue to hit, get hit with school taxes. I get it. We want to educate our kids. Our goal, goal is to keep them safe, keep them secure, get them educated. I don't think we need to build Taj Mahals to do that. I think if we need to make renovations to keep the security there, let's do it. I don't think leaving CTE is the answer. 
Um, if we're going to leave CTE, why do we want to hang on to it and have to keep the maintenance on it up? You know, there's a lot of unanswered questions that people are trying to ask you that, that they're not getting answers to. You know, for me personally, looking at the link that you sent me last week for last week's meeting, the increase in tax is going to be a couple hundred dollars. My husband and I are going to be retiring. We can't, our, right now, our property tax is almost more than what our mortgage was. People can't continue to pay that kind of tax. I get it. We want to educate our kids, but I think common sense has to come into play. Um, I went to New Oxford. It was a great school. I got a great education. I think we're still one of the greatest schools in the area, but I think we need to keep in, in check with our spending on things that aren't necessary. Listening to the presentation last week, they did a great job, but I think saying, oh, these cubbies are outdated. This is outdated. You know, when I went to school here, I went to Peter Street. That was outdated. I wasn't traumatized because I had to go to a school that didn't have the latest and greatest cubbies and the latest and greatest magic floors. I think we need to be feasibly responsible for the taxpayers. Let's teach our kids in a good, secure, safe education. And let's look at feasibility of not building Taj Mahal School. You don't need to do it. CT As a parent of a child that went to CTE, I went to CTE. Living at that end of the district, I would not want my A through three child bus to New Oxford. I can't imagine any parent would. That's probably another half hour, 45 minutes a day on a bus for a child that age. That's a lot. So I think you need to consider that too. Folks that live at that end of the district, CTE needs to stay there and it needs to function. So renovating CTE, in my opinion, updating what needs to be updated is the answer not closing it and then hanging on to it as to maintain a building we're not even going to use. That doesn't make sense. So I'm just asking the board to think about the fiscal responsibility to the taxpayers. Because we all know once those taxes go up, they're not coming down. And unfortunately, that's the reality of it. Going to get to the point where people just aren't going to be able to stay in their homes because they can't afford it. And it, that's, a, that's a sad fact. Do you have another question, Dr. No, we do have our presenter who just okay. came in. Okay. So uh, we'll come back to public comment. Uh, on our Zoom, we have Ron. Yes, Mr. Evelyn. Okay. So Mr. Uh, Ron Van Horner from Decision Insight will be coming up here on the screen in just one moment. Okay, you ready for me? All right, let's test out the audio. Thank you, Ron. You are welcome. Can everyone hear me okay? <clears throat> Am I coming through audio wise? Do yes. I sound all right? Okay, great. Um, so uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so you do see Power School, and I know uh, there's the names have changed, so I wanted to give that context right off the bat. Um, Decision Insight was actually acquired by Power School in October of 2020. Um, I've been with uh, what was Decision Insight and now Power School for 12 years and working with districts with um, better understanding enrollment and enrollment trends for 12 years. So um, our name has changed. We're part of a larger company, but what we do uh, for our district clients remains the same. Um, I'll walk through just a brief um, touch on what uh, the work we did complete on behalf of the district and give you some data points, but largely I'm here tonight to answer any questions about not only what does our data show, but how we uh, arrived at those numbers. And I'll uh, endeavor to answer any questions that come up along the way. Let me share my screen. So you're actually going to get a little glimpse into the platform that um, is available for district staff to access, but it's also used extensively by our team of analysts. And what I'll show you quickly, um, does it is 
uh, very important for us to project your enrollment and project it accurately. So our projections for uh, our district clients do begin at the student level. So you'll see here a lot of data on the screen, but these uh, dots all represent at least one student. And you can see that the technology has um, a lot of analytics around where students live and where they attend. Um, all of this is used to uh, start with very small geographic areas. And we uh, that's where our two 10-year projections begin. So we will actually uh, generate unique 10-year projections for these small geographies. And then it's aggregated up for your middle, high, and district-wide total. We also have comp a very comprehensive database of demographic data. Uh, I won't dive into all of that tonight, but we have information about live births, um, we have information about the changing demographic landscape for all of all of the United States, but specifically um, your district's geography. And all of that is then used as uh, supporting data to make sure we're projecting your enrollment and projecting it as accurately as possible. I'll go ahead and bring up a uh, one of your projections. You'll see that um, I'm gonna be looking at our moderate projection uh, right off the bat here. Um, we do produce two 10-year projections, um, a moderate and a conservative. The moderate is always going to show the greatest amount of growth. Um, the reason we do two is that out at a 10-year time horizon, you can have really two looks at your long-term trend. So the moderate in your situation is going to show the most growth. Um, here is a graph, something to point out. Um, 2020 here as we all know, was an unusual anomalous year because of the pandemic and everything going on. Um, but we are showing a, I would say, a modest amount of growth. Um, you do see that leveling to a degree out at 2027 and beyond. And that is true um, algorithmically, we do do that. Um, we don't just take a couple of years of projections and then project that out like it's gonna continue forever. In our experience, um, generally we do uh, temper some of those projections out in the outer years. Um, a lot of our clients do have new housing growth, and that is true of your district as well. I'm going to turn off uh, some of these plots. You'll see these red areas that are all um, on the map. Those are new housing developments that our team has researched. We gather information about what's being built. The reason we map it is that we can know um, which zones those developments fall in, and we can allocate the, the impact of the new housing to the appropriate school. And I'll go ahead and just pull up the list of developments we have here. Um, you can see all the project names are listed here. We do categorize them as single unit detached and attached homes um, and multifamily. In your circumstance, we don't have any multifamily uh, pro uh, projects in this list here. And these here are the total number of units that are expected to be sold and occupied and these in the year. And this year would always refer to the school year. Uh, so this would be the 23, 24 school year, 24, 25, and so on. And uh, that phasing is really important so we can have a sense as to when that is expected to be sold and occupied. The housing, we do take two looks at that as well. Um, we tend, and this is a graph that shows this, uh, the conservative projection here is this uh, lighter color and the moderate is going to be this um, blue color. So we do tend to temper the rate at which homes are built very modestly in the conservative projection. And that is to account for things like slowdown in the rate of homes being sold, uh, slowdowns due to delays in the construction and things like that. Um, we take the moderate data just as the planning agencies and developers provide it to us. So the moderate is really a look at everything they expect to sell uh, and build and sell in, in a given time. But in our, the conservative does look at this as there's inevitable delays. Uh, sometimes developers don't sell homes as fast as they expect. So that is modeled in the conservative projection. Um, here, is a listing of all of the units expected to be sold and occupied in a given year. This again is the moderate. Um, and then this here is the total number of students 
aggregate over a 10 year time horizon. So you'll see that there's about 783 total students expected in the moderate forecast just from new housing. So for a lot of our clients, um, new housing is a very big driver uh, of enrollment growth and you'll see in your projections that is uh, factored in. So that is a quick um, review of the projections. I can absolutely dive into a greater detail with the methodology or any of the data we used. If there are any questions, um, love to hear those. Good question, that is how, how do you uh, factor for homeschool trend, the homeschool trends that are going on right now? Yes, so um, if your district <clears throat> Uh, were to have experienced a decline in enrollment um, due to homeschooling, and if that is something that's been happening historically, um, that would get picked up in our regular um, our regular uh, process of generating en enrollment projections. Um, we do a lot of research on national trends. Um, two big things we're seeing: one, at a national level, our fertility rate or birth rate is actually not enough to replace ourselves. Um, the birth rate or fertility rate should be a 2.1 on a national average, and the United States is about a 1.6. So there, the future is one where there are going to be fewer school age individuals. We also saw during the pandemic that K-12 public education, there was um, some loss of students and private homeschooling and charter schools did actually grow in some areas. So some of that is... Um, very uh, apparent in certain areas. Um, I would also note, and I, I skipped over this in my presentation, prior to doing your projections, we do also meet with staff and talk about some things that may not be readily apparent in the data, like if there's been any increase in charter, or students leaving for charters or homeschool. So some of that is uh, picked up in that human uh, conversation, that interaction with our researchers and analysts and your team. Um, and we take that into account when we're projecting the enrollment. Um, any, uh, did that answer your question? Any follow-up questions? I don't know how to answer that. I just wondered if it was factored into his projections. Yes. Okay. We have one more question over here. Um, do you factor in the potential that some of those developments might be like retirement communities? 50 yes. Number? Absolutely. So, um, and that's a great question. The, we do um, have encountered that and we've actually encountered a number of um, areas in some parts where there's graduate housing or there's student housing and things like that. Um, so you'll see here this uh, a lot of numbers on this page, but in each project, we do break it out um, in this report into different phases. Um, it might be that they're all single unit detached homes, but maybe this is a, a, a phase. This is elementary, middle and high. Sometimes you'll see uh, a phase that it's maybe a little higher price point. Um, but in the event that a development is found to be say 55 plus a retirement community, we would enter it here so it is listed but generally we would have a rate of zero if it, indeed there was, it was a community where um, there was no young persons allowed to reside there. So we do include it so that uh, our clients know that we did the research, um, but we would just apply a rate of zero to that so that it wouldn't produce any students and, and hence it wouldn't be reflected in your projection. We have another question here in the back. How, how does units of housing sold equate to the number of students that are going to uh, equate to that same unit? Yes, so um, the total number of units, what we do is we take those total number of units and then we apply these rates that you see here, which is just a mathematical factor to the total number of units, and then we apply it to the year it's expected to be sold and occupied. So. Um, it, this is a, there's a lot of math there. It, it's effectively taking uh, the best data in terms of what, what types of properties have generated students in the past. And we apply that to the new potential homes. 
uh, mathematically to arrive at a number of students. So it, it is not a situation where we go to each individual home and see if there's students there. It, it is a mathematical projection, but these rates um, here, a lower rate would indicate that we don't expect that type of housing to have a lot of students. Um, an example I would give of that, if say like an um, like a urban loft, right, that was designed for a young professional, more than likely they're not going to have a lot of children in that type of housing. Um, as compared to a four bedroom suburban home, which is designed for a family, we would apply a higher rate to that to then result in uh, a student generated count, um, if that makes sense. So um, the, the, the rates times the units then result in students. Um, you said that you and this, the company named that prior um, have been doing this for 12 years. <clears throat> How often are your projections correct or short or too high? Do you know those numbers? Yes. Um, so I personally have been doing this for 12 years. Um, the, the, the platform and the solution has been available for districts for 19, almost 20. Um, and our projections, um, we feel very strongly that we have the most accurate uh, enrollment forecasts available. Um, that's due to the technology we apply. Um, there are times when our projections are off um, and it is a projection. I mean, it is, we take the best data we have, uh, the best information we can gather from the district team and we project that forward. Um, we have had a number of clients that have uh, we've been fortunate enough, they've been with us for the entirety of the 10 years. So, um, and, and we've gone back and done some analysis and checked. Our projections um, do come in between those two, uh, moderate and conservative, and I can show you a graph of what that looks like. Um, so some, some years were closer to the moderate and some years were closer to the um, conservative. Um, there are times when uh, the, the actuals, I'm drawing this here, your actual should do uh, come in something like this, where it'd be between the, the high of the moderate and the low of the conservative. Um, there are times when our projections are off. Um, there's no question that, I mean, we're, we're definitely not perfect. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times that does uh, as a result of potentially bad data, um, or the biggest one is new housing, right? If there was something really substantial or a dramatic change in the housing landscape of the market, um, that would obviously result in our projections being off or not as accurate as we would like. Um, we're cautioning all our clients right now to um, really be just aware of the housing and be aware that the housing market is a little bit in flux. We've had a, in the last uh, 18 months, interest rates raise, rise dramatically. Um, so what is expected is, is a slowdown there, um, but we also uh, do these, this work on an annual basis. So um, every year we would do, update the new housing research and every year we would generate new projections and that's designed to accommodate and pick up some of those changes in the market, which is always uh, changing, it's heating up and cooling. So um, I hope I answered your question. Um, we, we feel very strongly that uh, we, we know our clients rely on this data to make very important decisions. Um, and there's very robust uh, quality checks and uh, very robust work done to ensure we're putting out the most accurate data possible. Ms. Sarge, do you have a follow up with this question? Um, it's related. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the things that we keep hearing through all of these projections is new housing and development and what kind of communities they're going to be. Um, what we're what I would like to know is where in all of this do renters and um, you know like poverty level families that maybe have more kids that are in squeezing into a two bedroom house where do those kinds of data points come in to this fact? Yes, so um, one of the one of the reasons why we do have the ability to uh, display students on the map, and so you can see here, there is a development um, that is on you know it's in our platform and it's it's an, it's one that we've done research on, and there are some students in there, 
And if I were to uh, define this area, I can get an exact count of students. So we do have the ability to drill into some of those uh, developments and actually see um, just how many students are um, coming from that type of new housing. Um, we also have a significant amount of demographic data that we have access to. So we have the ability to uh, really dive into that. Um, I'll just give you a look at some of the data we have here, uh, population, average income, phase of life, family diversity, et cetera. So um, there, we have seen that with a number of our, our clients where um, there are multi-generational homes or uh, families that live together. But the, the biggest reason we uh, want to stay on top of the new housing is that increase in net new housing, um, there's an additive aspect of increasing your enrollment. So whenever you have an increase in the housing stock, for a given area, there's more people that could reside there, which would mean you'd have potentially more students. So um, in, our, in our research, we look at things like price point, uh, the type of housing nearby and the type and just how many students you're um, acquiring from those areas. Um, so could we a follow up? Yes. So basically you cannot statistically state how many of those are actually rental or any kind of increase in rental properties is my question. Um, so we don't differentiate between whether a new house um, or new housing is destined to be a rental home or a uh, sold uh, to a, a buyer, an individual buyer. Um, what we're concerned about is whether or not uh, that, well, what, how many students the district could expect from that type of housing. Um, so multifamily, whether it's apartments, which are rental units or condos, which are sold, um, our focus is, is really just to determine how many units are there and the probability of um, how many students you can expect from that. So um, in our, in our raw data we gather, we could uh, potentially uh, gain data on whether or not they're destined to be rental or um, sold. But um, for our work, we just look at the, you know, how, what other similar type properties have generated in the past and we apply the, uh, the mathematics to it to result in students. Um, you didn't actually give us your projection error rate over the last year, last 10 years, last 20 years. You just said it was wonderful. It was the best. Why didn't you hear any actual numbers? Our, our district-wide projections are less than 1% off uh, mm -hmm. on a district-wide basis. For what period of time? Uh, that's our ongoing uh, goal in terms of for all of our projections. Um, I don't have, we do have diagnostic reporting in our platform um, that will um, each year, um, a client, uh, we start again with their projections. We will look at what we projected last year and then what their actuals were. And on, on a, each individual case basis, our team's goal, what they're measured on is being less than a 1% difference. Um, I don't have data on across our 250 districts and average, um, but I just know that that is where we expect to be. Less than 1% year to year is what you're saying then? Correct. Okay. Did you take the bypass um, that's proposed into account as well in your figures and how that might affect population? Um, so I would have to check on, with the analyst on that. Um, I'm not individual, I'm not personally familiar with that, so I couldn't speak to that. So I don't know if it was or was not. I could check and follow up uh, with our team and, and okay. ask, the, uh, ask that to be reported back to, to the district uh, leadership. <laughs> yes, the data were collected in August 2022. So at that point, the extension project had already been approved. 
you know, so we knew that it was moving forward. It's likely, Ron, that that would have been included. Mr. Summers. So two things, the example you used to answer Melanie's question, that is Eagle View Mobile Home Park. Um, that was one of the things I was gonna to use tonight to talk to the board about. That is predominantly um, occupied by elderly residents that is owned by Legacy Mobile Home, I don't know, but it's Legacy. And they just got a land usage increase on their homes that there's serious pushback to us about what we can do about that. That increase is less than the proposed tax increase you're looking at in both options. And if any board member would like to go on a walk with me through that community, I'd gladly take you so you can talk to these people. You are seriously going to break the back of some elderly people in my community. And I don't think that's acceptable. And the page that you had listings of the um, developments, where do you get the data for what the developments are? And that's going to lead into another question. Sure. Um, we, we contact the planning agencies directly. And in the event that we need additional information, we will contact the developers if there's some data that we're not able to attend or uh, obtain. But we contact uh, any of the uh, applicable planning agencies and gather it directly from them. Define planning agency. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the entity that issues bur uh, building permits. Okay, I can tell you that's not true. One, you're missing that development on there. And two, you have a development listed that this no longer exists. So there's probably going to be a right to no request coming to somebody tomorrow for that, this presentation, so that there's a number of municipal supervisors here tonight that are very interested in these development numbers and where you came up with them. Mr. <laughs> Swope. If I'm understanding this correctly, you're using data for new housing. Are you taking into any type of consideration data of students and or families who may leave the district for various reasons? Yes, so um, the new housing is, the research is one kind of facet of this. Um, we do have very comprehensive data on the entire community. And we also have data, uh, there's a comparative analysis between the total number of students for a geography uh, that the district serves compared to the total number of school age individuals for a, um, that the US Census Bureau lives in a, in a specific geography. So if I were to select your entire district, I would get numbers on that. So we can look at um, historically over time, the amount of uh, students as a percentage compared to the whole that the district serves. And we can look at whether or not that's increasing or decreasing. Um, and we also have very comprehensive total community demographic data. Um, we have that also historically to look at uh, the makeup of the community past, present, and future. So that is all taken into account. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Um, to Mr. Suggs, it appears based upon an email from Power School earlier today that um, Abbottstown Borough, McSherry's Town Borough, New Oxford Borough, Berwick Township, Conewago Township, Hamilton Township, Mount Pleasant Township, Oxford Township, Stribbing Township. Tyrone Township were all contacted July 2022 for the updates. And uh, furthermore, these are updated. They reach out annually um, to each of the townships and the boroughs to collect this data. Thank you. Yes, uh, to you, uh, Mr. Sox. I believe last week you uh, you mentioned that we'd done a uh, independent verification of these numbers. So actually, uh, we did uh, over the course of last week using the census data as well as the Adams County planning data, and using a factor uh, looking at the population from 2020 to 2030, 
across the uh, 11 townships in the district uh, using a factor of uh, 2.5, assuming half a student. That's actually more than what they're using here. So, uh, but that's what's used in the 2020 survey uh, for the census as far as uh, residents per house. Uh, and the number that we came up with as far as students using that formula is about 770. Um, if we back that down to what the uh, census says for uh, the only information I found was with Conawaga Township in their comprehensive plan, it backs it down to um, I mean, it's 2.2 or 2.3 uh, residents per household by the time we get to 2030. If we factor that in, it brings us into about 700. Uh, I don't know the number. The number that was here went by. I didn't write it down, but I think it was about 730. So our numbers independently are confirming the uh, the number of new students that are coming in based upon the census data and the Adams County Planning Commission. Thank you. Is that every year? That's over the 10 year period, which is what they're talking about here from 2020 to 2030. Mr. Schaefer, did you have a question? It's more of a statement than a question, whereas the Eisenhower Drive extension is continuously being used to inflate projections for population growth. More than 70% of the path of the bypass, should it go through, goes through industrial and land preservation. The land preservation, more than, I believe it's more than 50% that's in the land preservation can never be developed. Never. It is preserved throughout the life of the land and, you know, way beyond my years and everybody's years in here. Um, so, the gentleman that's giving his presentation, he was asked a question pertaining to the Eisenhower Drive extension um, that should be looked into and, and taken out of the projections on development because it is not going to bring any more development. It's not going to bring any more children into the district. Any questions from the back? Harry? Yeah. In reference to the information that was on the different community communities that you had on your page there, where could we find that information? Uh, I tried to look at it as quickly as I could, but, you know, it's an awful lot of numbers up there. Um, certainly, we know of uh, two developments in that that are no longer even zoned residential. They're now zoned industrial, um, and they were substantial. They were well, close to 200 plus acres of land that was at one time scheduled to be residential. And if, if this study was done in July of last year, the rezoning took place in November of last year. So it's a rather substantial you know, number of homes that are no longer gonna be part of this database. And I think it really, really needs to be looked at. I, as, as a supervisor, would like to see you know, a, uh, that list of developments and a little bit closer. So I just, I, I asked before to be able to see this information uh, and have it emailed to me. I haven't yet seen it yet. I'd like to be able to drill down and just to be able to verify it. If you say that it's it's going to happen or that it's on there, that's fine, but we just wanna be able to verify that. And the question also would be, are these entitled plans or are these just plans? Because there's a difference between a community that is just being planned or one that is fully entitled and ready to be built. Because we don't, we've seen numerous times where a lot of these are, are planned, but they never really happen. And, you know, these projections are, are gonna cost and, you know, are creating the need to spend a tremendous amount of money. We just wanna make sure that the, the information is accurate. And if you lose, you know, 15 or 20% because of one development not going in, that can be a substantial difference. So, and, and one more question, how many, you're saying it's 0.5 students per new house is what the average is, what they're figuring for, I believe is what someone said. If they can clarify that, I'd like that information as well. Mr. Kenshu. 
Um, I, I can speak to that. Um, <clears throat> so um, one, the uh, any of this data here, um, we can absolutely uh, share that with district staff and then they can uh, make that available however they would like to. Um, there is always um, a challenge with new housing in the sense that uh, we do the research at a point in time and there's always projects being added and taken away. Um, certainly if there is a substantial uh, uh, development that were to just be canceled or were to have gone away, um, we can absolutely update uh, the data to reflect that. And we do that on an ongoing annual basis. Um, but if we needed to, redo that and redo the projections, taking out a, a forecast, we, we could absolutely do that. Um, the, the rates we use for um, <coughs> are individual in terms of the, the uh, each development and sometimes even different phases of a development. If it was a large development, they may have different types of housing even within one development. So um, all of the different uh, factors that we apply mathematically um, are unique to each project. So there's not one average um, for across the board. Um, as I mentioned before, there could be um, certain types of housing that is maybe more suitable or more designed for a, a young professional, which wouldn't result in a lot of kids. Um, and there's others that are would be higher. So, um, but this can also be reported out. We can make this available. Um, really anything in that I'm showing today, there can be, um, we can provide for people to look at. Yeah, and what I'd say on that, if you look at the, the numbers here, it's actually less than 0.5 uh, with the, the multipliers that are, are there. But the 0.5 comes from the sense it's also a standard metric that's used. It's actually used in the Conewago Township uh, Comprehensive Plan to plan for growth. Uh, so to put that into real terms, what does that mean? It's kind of um, nebulous, right? So at 2.5 residents per household, if you say, you know, what does that mean for uh, five houses or uh, so five times 2.5, I'm sorry, four times 2.5 gets you to 10, right? So there's 10 people. Uh, for 10 people moving in at a um, 2.5 per household means that you have three houses of two, which is consistent with the trends that we're seeing where we're not seeing families come in. We're seeing, I'll just say, the retirement or the empty nesters uh, coming in. So three out of every four houses only have two people, no students, right? And then you have one house, and this is... Um, starting to go out of sync with the data, but one house that has, I'll say your traditional nuclear family, to uh, two parents, two students, right? So that's how you get to 10. So that demographic, you know, you gotta, you gotta have some sort of metric. It fits with what we're doing as an independent assessment of these numbers. And again, they do come into alignment uh, and it fits with the trends. We heard you last week that, you know, the, uh, it is an older crowd. They're not having the, you know, the children that we had. Uh, so there is some consistency there. That's where that came from. One more. You can't read the font for our distance. That's why I don't know if you can that up. Read the, That's why. Uh, you can read, read, the, read header, the, yeah. the header, but you can't read the columns and the rows. The so this there. is live stream. You will be able to see this online. Okay. And I'm also hearing there'll be a right to know request. So we were happy to provide that information to you. Well, there we go. That's, That's so much better. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. But it's also online like too to refer back to. Oh. Yeah. Luann? Sorry. That's right. Um, I'm a Conewago Township Supervisor, and I'm looking at the first uh, development you have listed there, and you have Errors Point listed three times. Maybe I'm being, you know, I'm looking at it. What's why three times? Elementary, uh, middle, high school. So over all the students that you're looking at, you're looking at approximately 700 students per year. Is that what you're saying? It, over, the, over the course of the 10 years, 700 students. So those 700 students could be 
as you said, elementary, high school, and middle school. They could also be going to parochial schools. They could be homeschooled. They could be going to uh, cyber schools or any of the other things. I thought the focus on the school that we're talking about at this point with CTE and NOE and the influx of students onto them, if you're looking at it this way, you're looking at 700 over the course, not basing it just on the elementary students, which is where this whole thing I thought was going, was for the CTE and the NOE. Am I wrong or am I right? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> So the numbers that are being presented here in the study was across all houses. There, there isn't a way to go in and survey or you're only going to you know, have young kids. So that's why it's broken out into the elementary, middle and high school. That consolidated data is a part of um, uh, the report where they take a look at, if you remember last week, the school of interest, which is what I think you remember, you know, the schools of interest was the elementary, which is projected to be at 100% capacity in five, seven years. Um, so that's based upon the data that is in here. Um, so it's not 700 students in seven years, uh, all going to the elementary, it's coming to the, to the district, but that with the um, formulas and such that are used, uh, the, there's and you know that's based upon the type of community that's going in and you know the data shows historically that this is uh, you know, you're gonna have this many elementary or this percent and that's what's used to uh, do that projection that single table uh, that was presented last week which said that I think the high school or the middle schools were 100 uh, percent and then the high schools and the middle school was like 60 70 percent and CVIS was, I think, 70, 80%. Ron, can you go to your projections that show the enrollment, the enrollment projections by grade level? Sure. Uh, give me one second to pull that up. And I think this is going to be very hard to see on the screen, but let's see what we can do here. <clears throat> and let me see if I can actually, this might be easier to see. Um, okay, let's start here. I, al I also have one that is uh, 10 year. <clears throat> Uh, we put moderate in this report, um, mainly because it's just easier to see because it's, uh, doesn't go out as far. So we can start here and then I can always look into something. But this is the moderate. So again, this is gonna show um, the greatest amount of growth. So what our firm will do is when that information is provided for the projected enrollment, we will look, we will compare the building capacity for each of the schools to that projected enrollment. And in the presentation uh, last week, and then presentation we gave in 2021, um, your uh, intermediate school, the middle school and the high school still has the capacity for more enrollment, for more enrollment growth. So there's enough seats that um, they can operate comfortably. However, at the elementary level, K through three, based upon those projections, within three to four years, they will be at 100% capacity. So that's why there's more of a focus on the K-3 grade levels. In addition to some educational program inequities between the two schools. I think the district, um, one of the guiding principles that they established very early on is they wanted all the students in, in the district to have the same opportunities. And there's some differences between the operation layout, um, some of the opportunities of uh, the CTE students to the NOE students. Not curriculum based, but as far as the spaces within the buildings. Full cafeteria, 
Um, CTE has a gym that has to be used as a cafeteria, things like that. Ms. Crew, did you have a question? I mean, yeah, I was just kind of. I almost pass it back to Harry then. So I just want to kind of recap that a lot of you're saying July 2022 was the last time that everything was gathered to make these pretty charts, correct? Is that question for me? Yeah. yeah the um, the research, uh, I can find out exactly. Um, this final report, which I'm showing there, <clears throat> uh, was finalized in February. But the new housing research was done in July. Let me find out exactly when. July 2022. Mm -hmm. yep. a pretty good answer from everyone in the room. Um, and we've already established that some of those developments are going through the way that they looked then. How long will it be till we can get accurate up-to-date numbers and for the one chart you showed it didn't look like a very vast elevation over the next couple of years so i'm not really sure why this seems so dire uh we're talking about this here this the, the graph it's a straight line I'm not even sure a marble would roll down it no nope, not that one the one you drew the yellow line on uh, uh, yes, that was showing the difference um, between the moderate and the conservative. Um, well, these these are the this is a graph of the projections. Um, so this is um, there is growth. Um, the the it to answer your first question, um, we can have our team um, circle back and if there are specific uh, developments that there's evidence or there's under knowledge that those have uh, dramatically changed or have ceased or are not going to happen anymore. Um, yeah, we can update the projections very rapidly so we can provide uh, staff with uh, an updated projection. Uh, we'll go back and contact those uh, uh, townships again and find out what exactly happened. And <clears throat> if there's a, a change that needs to be made, we can make that change. Again, um, so you're showing 783 students over the next 10 years. What was it in the previous 10 years from 2012 till 2022? Do you have that information? I don't I don't have that information. Um, it seems that that would be somewhat helpful to have because then we would be able, because we've had a lot of housing developments going in at that time as well. And I think it would be helpful if we had what that, what the total number of students was from in that time frame versus the next 10 years that you're projecting. So. Um, yes, yeah, so we, I mean, that is uh, fairly easy to accomplish. We would have, you would have to go back over that 10 year period and from all of the uh, townships gather, gather information about what is being, what has been built. Um, and then we can actually with the plotting count um, how many students are coming from those those developments. So that is possible. Um, that getting the data around everything that's been built over a decade, that can be challenging. Um, just making sure that there's quite a bit of research involved there. Um, Mr. Kinshaw? Sure, sure. Um, so according to the census and the research that we did, which um, uh, the 20 in our area, 2010 to 2020 was somewhat of an anomaly. Uh, per the census and that things stay were, were pretty steady from a growth standpoint. I think Conawaga Township uh, last um, meeting said that the population of 80 people, uh, the census shows 800, but minimal, right? Um, in the uh, census, uh, what's projected for 2020 to 2040, 2050 is similar growth, not as rapid, but similar growth to what uh, we experienced uh, 2090 to 2010. So for whatever reason, 2010 to 2020 was somewhat of a leveling off period uh, from the, the fast growth that we had from 1990 to 2010. 
there is a projection, not as fast, but we are going to experience growth again from 2020 to 2050 per the census. <laughs> Something that happened, we went through this feasibility study back in, in the end of the 1900s, 1998-99. And since that time, add the number of students that we've had to our schools. We built CBIS. Had we not built that, we would have been overflow. We've been doing this a long time ago. When we should have done it again in 2011, uh, we did not do it because for the same reason, people didn't want taxes to grow, so we stayed conservative. Now we don't have a choice. Now we don't, we keep our student population per room at approximately 20 to 25 students in the lower levels. As you get to the high school, some of them are higher, but if we do not take into consideration for future growth, um, we're gonna be here in 10 years spending twice the money trying to do the same thing that we're talking about this evening. So right now what we're trying to do is being conservative with the numbers that are being presented to us because we haven't, as uh, was pointed out earlier, we do not have a crystal ball. If we had a crystal ball, this would be an easy decision. I see Mr. Van Orden is up against the time crunch, Dr. Perry. Yes. Were there any final questions from Mr. Van Orden because he needs to one more, I would say, Matt. Um, we're all familiar with the Georgia Guidestones and what was written on it and their agenda to depopulate the world. Higher trends of Adam and Steve or Addie and Eve equals no children. There's a higher rate of stillbirths and miscarriages and deaths of children and mothers. In reference to your statistics, currently, um, logically, how can your 10 year estimate be correct? We all know what happened to DeMar. I'm in the hospital only four hours a month normally, and so far this year, I had a 34-year-old young lady with myocarditis, kidney failure, and cancer. Last week, a young lady at 40 came in with a cardiac arrest, and within two hours, she passed. So these statistics are going to continue to climb. So I don't think that your statements are going to be correct. I think it was more of a statement. Is that correct? I just want to challenging that. challenging the, the projection. Are there any other questions for Mr. Van Orden? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, want a question? No, not other than you use the word expect and your projections, and and I understand the best we got to go on. I guess I just wanted to know how good you guys really are. He said, I know what he said. Yes, um, so I am intentionally um, cautious with using, uh, I, I do use that word intentionally, expect, because it is a projection. Um, we uh, feel that we have the most robust uh, and we've spent a considerable amount of uh, energy and uh, money building a system that is the most capable available, but it is a projection. And there is an element where you're taking the best data you have at a point in time and projecting that out. So I always want to make sure that people have the right context about the data. They have the information. They understand where it's from. Um, but we are forecasting 10 years out into the future. Um, and so people just have to know that uh, there are assumptions inherent in every projection. So um, <coughs> We, we hold our projections out with a high degree of confidence, and we know that our, our clients do make very important and big decisions based on it. So our effort and uh, diligence in terms of producing these numbers, uh, we, we hold that in uh, 
very high regard and we, we absolutely endeavor to do the best uh, we absolutely can. All right, thank you. Mr. Orton, <laughs> um, Van Orton, we thank appreciate you. you taking the time to join us this evening. I know that we were a little bit over time. Community thanks you as well. Have a great evening. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Do you want to light up? Whatever the audience. Okay. Yes. Good question. So I guess my first statement here is uh, we have stated about projections into 2050 and about how we may uh, run out of school classrooms for our students at that far ahead in our future. I myself as a community member do not have a problem with building a new school if we need it for our children because of growth. Where my problem lays is CTE, New Oxford Elementary, that have not been maintained over the years and now require extensive amounts of money to bring them up to where they need to be for standards plus additions added to them. The additions I don't have a problem with. So that brings me to our school budget. Of only 5% of our budget is put into the maintenance of our facilities where we have 60% of our budget going towards our administration and our teachers. There seems to me that there's gotta be some kind of adjustment in our future budgets to put, to allocate more money into the maintenance of our properties. So in 2015, we can continue to keep the schools open that are normally operating at that time and possibly adding an addition space within those facilities or a new school. I think the community could justify that more than to walk away from properties and leave them abandoned or, you know, I mean, help me out here. But you see my point. But on my second thing I'd like to also add is the Brethren Home continuously grows. And I understand that that's an elderly environment, 55 and over, retired, so on and so on. But they are excluded from school taxes. Are they? They were? Are they still? There is. No, there are certain properties that have a... Um, adjusted value it was properties that they had years ago that have to do with the health care but the other properties that they have been purchasing are 100 taxable and that the adams county courthouse it, i'm sorry please explain correct that okay go ahead since since you're all knowing so my question is if i moved into the brother in home and i bought a village home there am i expected to pay school taxes there is this, the, you as the owner of the cottage one pay, but the brother home sends us, they pay taxes. There are certain properties that are not valued at 100% assessment, but they do pay taxes. At minimum. Minimal. At, it depends on which properties it is as to the value of whether they pay 100% or they pay at a 50% value. There are lawsuits out there where by the, there are multiple, <laughs> Uh, present home type facilities that sued the, the, the state saying they're for nonprofit, therefore they should not be taxed. We have an agreement with the brethren home that properties where individuals live like off the um, off the medical facility do pay a part in tax. So yes, they 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 have an agreement with us. This was done back years ago. They renewed it again, and we are we are living at, at what they'll give us at this point. No, they're partial. So, so they're they, dictating they're you. Partial. 
Yeah. I can clarify that you you participate in what's called a pilot program, a payment in lieu of taxes that they agree voluntarily to pay you a percentage, not one hundred percent. No, they they have surpassed the payment in lieu of taxes. We no longer have a payment in lieu of taxes because their developments have expanded to the point where they have reached that level of taxes. They never dipped below what they paid. So in good faith. What they did was they continued to pay us a payment in lieu of taxes to equal the same amount. So they never dipped below what they were paying. They didn't want to have any ill effects on the district. So what has happened now is the properties that they have been adding come on either some come on at 50%, some come on at 100%. You're welcome to call Susan Miller at um, Adams County Courthouse. But they are paying for those properties. They no longer give us a payment in lieu of taxes. Okay. I just, is it clear though that they do not pay 100%? Certain properties, they do not. Not all. It depends. There's, as Mr. Gruff was explaining, certain properties that have, um, I believe it's like the medical um, portion, they don't, but other properties that they own do. The independent living, I guess, the cottages. Right. You're saying that they pay 100% of your taxes? They're paying 100%. So, okay. There are certain yeah, other projects. So, yes, sir. I just wanted to follow up on your comment and question about the maintenance of the buildings. So, um, at the presentation last week, um, I stated that the average age of a school building in the United States is 40 years old. And the life expectancy of these building systems and interior finishes is only 20 years old. As a neutral observer, and we work with school districts across Pennsylvania, in Maryland, in Virginia, what we're seeing in your facilities is not unlike any other district. It is not a lack of maintenance. It's just, it's just the age of the buildings. This is not unlike anything that we would see in a building that hasn't had a renovation in over 20 years. So this is common. And you know, we understand the efforts that the facilities department has to go through uh, to keep up with the maintenance of the buildings, but to replace these systems, to upgrade the systems, sometimes it's just not that easy. These buildings are heavily, heavily used with all the occupants, all the students coming in, the staff um, in the evening, during the school day. This is, this is common. I, 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 I also made that comment last week that showing the deficiencies of the building that were pointed out was, was not to show that the buildings were lacking attention and maintenance, but in fact, they were just showing their age. Thank you. But, you know, growing up, I am from the McSherry Sound area. So I'm looking at your Catholic schools, Annunciation, Delone. They've been around a lot longer than before I was there. My parents went to those schools and they are still operating and functioning with slight updates within the, the buildings. So you're looking at sure. at least 80 years or long, and I, I don't have a date as to when they were built, but Delones at least 80 years. There are bidding, there are 1956. Because this is a public school, they have to abide by state bidding requirements that a parochial or a private school does not have to abide by. So starting a construction project or any construction improvements to any of those schools is a much easier process than what it is for a public school. And the public schools, because of the bidding process, we're talking more money. Because of it being a bid, contractors are driving that cost up to what it really actually factors into than the materials. 
state the state it dictates the, the there's prevailing wage rates that okay. the district has right. state is driving yeah. and the state is driving what we need to abide by right and almost every decision that we make the state tells us what we can do we can only live by what they give us to do and when, when mr colstock says that this is what it's going to cost it's because of the prevailing wage that you must put plug in there what he projects it will cost. Now, if you know, if you want to use local uh, uh, local contractors, they can by all means bid on it. But when they do the work, even though they normally do not pay a prevailing wage, in this case, if they do the work for the school, they will have to pay that prevailing wage and still will have to bid it at that rate. So again, the state dictates almost everything that we can do. And to Mr. Colstar's point, the Catholic school does not. They can bring anybody they want to in there and they can do it at a minimum. And the Catholic school, a lot of times, find people that will donate their time where we cannot do that. And the private schools can also increase tuition whenever they please. It all increases taxes. It is smaller buildings. It's a little easier to contain the rules to Anyway, just want to make sure that you understand apples for apples. I think we have time for two more questions, Charlie. I don't speak on behalf of the other elected officials that are here tonight, bro, council members and township supervisors, but I do believe that they share the same concern that I have with how much pain is going to be inflicted on the property owner more so the most vulnerable of all of us, which are the seniors and those with disabilities who have fixed incomes. And I believe I touched base on this at the last meeting. Not everyone has a pension and a social security. There are members in our community that only have social security. And I believe on a $300,000 house, the tax increase you know, with the most extreme portion was around $690, that will break them, that will tax them out of their house. And I think all of us here today want to protect the most vulnerable. We all know that the school needs upgrades. I don't think anybody is disputing that there needs to be some improvements. My concern is how much pain is gonna be inflicted on the taxpayer and to make that as less painful as possible. Dr. Brian? I'd like to put a little bit of different twist on it and uh, a little more positive twist and thank the board uh, as well as the administration. I've sat and listened now in three meetings and I've learned what the overarching goals are and the guiding principles. When you speak of addressing student, student population growth, that's one term. Uh, and what many folks don't understand is that population growth brings all different needs and all different challenges from different children with their special needs, whatever it may be, which additionally stresses the resources within a school or within a district. So to address student population is one factor, but also the needs of those new children coming to us uh, will have as well. Uh, the overarching goal of renovating and expanding our schools if needed, uh, obviously, is a good one. Addressing facility needs across the district, we can't argue with that. Uh, creating uh, equitable situations for all of our students who can argue with that. Elevating safety, reduce or eliminate the interaction of private uh, vehicles uh, from our school vehicles. All of those make sound sense. Some of the guiding principles minimize during construction, if construction is approved, to minimize disruption to the educational experience during facility uh, improvement processes. Proceed in a fiscally responsible manner that maximizes both current and future taxpayer funds. Create safe, effective, efficient facilities for students and staff, as well as community when they attend events. The process of evaluating facility improvement options is difficult. And obviously, we've heard a lot about funds and taxes and the amount of money that we need to spend or can spend. Uh, those are all things that, that I appreciate that have been considered by the administration and the board. 
I want to take a little walk in history. A lot of people keep talking about, well, how do we know? How can we predict? I'm going to go all the way back to 1972. There was a gentleman that ran our district by the name of Docky. For those of us that have been around a long time, we understand what that means. There used to be a farm right over there, the Martin Farm, uh, where our middle school currently sits. And there was a Piper Farm behind us where now there's a development. And our small high school with only two corridors housed all of eighth grade, half of seventh grade, and the entire high school in 1972. We say that's 50 years ago. Well, this function that we're all involved in now is trying to plan out for the next 20 years only. So what has happened since 1972? Well, we all know the size of our current high school. It's no longer just two hallways with the shops out on the other side where you used to walk out through a little patio type access. Then there was a need to expand because of student growth where a junior high school was built where the current middle school is, which is about the third of the size of the current middle school. And that was supposed to take us to the future. And that house, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Ninth grade was upstairs, if anybody remembers that. And we said, okay, now we're getting to push again. Student population, student growth. So what did John and Lance do then? John Spangler and Lance Landau. They said, okay, let's expand the middle school. So they tripled the size of the middle school, and then it housed five, six, seven, and eight. And if you remember, the little fifth and sixth graders carry their own desk from the elementary school here to the current middle school. And it wasn't long after that, those buildings weren't big enough. And then we needed CBIS. So now we have CBIS. BIS. So what does the future really hold? If we really think that minimizing what we intend to do now is going to save taxpayer dollars, I'm not so sure. Or are we going to be back in here 10, 10 years from now concerned about the same issues? I have to have faith that the board and the administration is going to look at all the factors. I hope that they if they choose to build a new school, that they certainly do not build a K-1 facility and put another transition in the education process for our kids. I hope they don't squeeze a building between CBIS and the middle school. The campus is already crowded enough to take away current fields that are already there where the kids are safe to play, safe to practice, and allocate them over to this site where there's and raise this building and then have this openness for kids with no safety or security. So the answers are tough and it's a challenging process. But if we do choose to build, if the board does choose to build and the administration chooses to recommend that, I hope we utilize the land that was purchased years ago on the farm. Yes, it will be more expensive to build there, but if you're worried about the future, rather than cram another building on that campus, utilize the resources we have. If the board chooses to do, that, to do that, CTE can be sold. That's a valuable property. This property here, because that bubble is gonna move through our schools. We're worried about the elementaries now. But what happens when that bubble moves all the way through? Yes, we currently have space. And we say that we're what, 78% capacity at this point, roughly. What happens if that changes? If we maintain this building, we can move the district offices over to here, take technology from upstairs, and we have additional space in that building over there. So there's options to consider. It's not as easy as it sounds, uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity to sit and listen in three meetings. Um, I do have a unique perspective, having been in education for 39 years, as well as now working in the construction industry. So it's, it's difficult, it's very difficult. And I appreciate the opportunity to hear not only the opinions of our community, but also that of, of our board members and the folks that they have uh, enlisted to help us through this process. But my overarching goal is that my grandkids have the quality of education that I had when I walked these halls and that my kids had when they walked through these halls. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> We have time for one. 
we had a hand right here. Let me follow up. We're talking a lot about expenses, but is there or are there avenues for reimbursement to the district? Is that an entry? Uh, so the Department of Education used to give um, subsidy, which was called plan con reimbursement. That has been in a moratorium for the last 10, 10 years. Um, as I noted at the presentation last week, to be eligible for plan con reimbursement, um, a project, a district had to submit a feasibility study. Uh, so we've continued to follow their guidelines and checklist that in the event, um, that if funds were to become available, then we could get your project into the pipeline to, to receive that reimbursement. We have heard rumors now with the new governor uh, that there is possibility of bringing PlanCon um, back on board. Uh, and we, we wanna make sure that if it does, um, if it's going by the old guidelines or new guidelines that were potentially posed a few years ago, that we're prepared to submit your project for if you move forward with a project um, and it would be eligible uh, because there's different factors of whether it's new construction or additions or renovations, if they could potentially receive those uh, uh, that, that reimbursement uh, subsidy back. So. Again, don't have a crystal ball, but we're hopeful that at some point it uh, funds will be available from the Department of Education. Thank you, Mr. Colson. Okay, thank you all. Um, we also have Dr. Craig Rhythm, and I think to the, the point of the data and the questions that are coming from our community about the validity of the data and how we're collecting data, uh, Mr. Kinshu had mentioned how we've done our own internal research. Um, Crabtree Rorba has done the same. So this is in the spirit of triangulation of that data. We're attempting to see if it all points us in the same direction. So while it may not be perfect, at least it's pointing us in a direction that kind of says, yes, we're looking at three different subsets of data. Um, this is what they suggest. So with that, I'm just going to... Um, Turn it over to you, Dr. Webb. Sure, you gonna throw that PowerPoint up? That'd be great. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Perry, I hope you don't mind if I stand. It's not a sitter. Um, while she's putting that up, um, I am Fred Witham. I have uh, worked in public education for 35 years prior to my retirement. My doctor work was in school planning, uh, and I taught a course at Chippensburg for a decade. Um, and I was bringing uh, my classes, my graduate classes off and on to the architectural firm. And they offered me a job in 2019, knowing that I was doing these reports and the, from these courses. So I went ahead and what we did separate from Decision Insight was to produce our own set of enrollment projections. Um, we do that as a standard for districts who do not um, go with a third party. They do not use a Decision Insight or a Forecast 5 or one of the others. Um, and we also do it for districts who have third party projections just so that you can get a little bit of a check on the validity of what they're, what they're um, telling you. So I can tell you what we found. Apple TV? Yeah. 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 It's coming. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Sorry, my socks aren't pretty. I just was getting the data as recently as several hours ago and, and updating the tables. Um, but if you go to that second slide, uh, just so that you understand our methodology, because I think it kind of addresses some of the questions and concerns that um, is out there, um, particularly with the pandemic. There's your historic enrollment from 2013 to 2023. And we, um, when we did our enrollment projections, we took your growth rates five years prior to the pandemic. 
So we knew where you were going just before the pandemic hit. And you can see that at the end of the green box, your enrollment declines and then it starts to come back up and it was pretty much level for, for the past year. So while we assume that you're going to eventually turn back to the growth rates that you were having prior to the pandemic, we're also assuming that all the kids who are gone are not coming back, that your 2023 lower enrollment than in 1920 when the pandemic got hit is your permanent place to start from. And we do see those kids trickling back. It's just an understanding of where we are if you go to the next slide. Um, we, we do a lot of stuff with the census as well, um, just to kind of get a gauge on things. Um, over that five years that the data was drawn, and this is really important when it comes to new housing, over the five years that the data was drawn for your enrollment, you had 830 new residents, 390 new households, uh, 497 new housing units, and let me answer your rental question after I get that, so don't forget. Um, and your enrollment increased in that five-year period by 125 students. So what we want to see now with new development is, is the development growing quicker over the next five years? Is it anticipated to grow faster than it did over the five years that the data was drawn? If it's growing less, then your enrollment projections are really going to be a little bit too steep. If it's going to grow faster, then your enrollment projections are a little bit short. You have to decide where to where to level it off. But um, since from in, in that time period, um, you gained um, 276 housing units and 219 additional rental properties. So you're. you're you're getting a fair amount of, of rental properties that are that are coming in. So if you go to the next slide, and this is another answer to a question that came up. So when we figure out the students per household, again, we're going back to that exact same five-year period. And we're saying, what was your elementary, intermediate, middle, and high school populations? And what were the number of housing units each of those years? So you can see from 2015-16 to 2019-20, literally your, your um, students per household has been the same. Same thing with four to six, um, same thing with seven to eight, nine to 12 is actually dropping a little bit. But overall, we're seeing 0.33 students per household. So that's the number that we're using, and that is a lower number than national statistics because you are you. You're not the nation. So the numbers that we're using are, are based on that. And now the key, now here's the key thing. I, I, I want to qualify this when I show you these numbers. We're assuming that Decision Insights list is correct and that there are 1,450 properties. So these numbers adjust when the number of properties adjust. So adjusting the total number that you are projected to, to gain over the next five years is critical in helping the board come to a number of students that they can that they can plan on. Um, so if you go to the next slide, there's a lot of text up. So um, let's let's see if I can just swing this down. Um, the other piece I think that's important in the data is that decision insights have these 1,450 homes are are going to come in five years. I don't see it, not five years. Um, you know, rising interest rates, um, um, supply chain issues. So we did not use it five years. We did use the 1,450 units, but we drew it out over eight years. Um, and again, eight years is kind of, honestly, anybody tells you they got great projections past five years, mm, not so much. I mean, if you went back five years ago and said, What's the enrollment going to be in you know 21, 22? Nobody had a factor for the you know the pandemic. It just came out of nowhere. And there's just that was a big one, but there's lots of things that happen, like bypasses and other things that come in. So we really we really um, are focusing on five years, but we're bringing those developments in over eight. So we're projecting that you're going to get an additional 12 elementary students per year in grades K to three. Um, nine in uh, four to six, six and seven, and eight, and 13 in nine through 12. Um, if you go to the next slide, 
So here's, <clears throat> this is a comparison. I know that's kind of hard to see. I'm sure Dr. Perry will make it available to you. Uh, but the, the purple line is decision insights, moderate projection. So that's what they said you're gonna get is your enrollment each year through 27, 28. There are three lines that are lying on top of each other. Those lines are um, our projections based on what happened three years prior to the pandemic and our projections based on what happened five years prior to the pandemic. And we've been doing these and checking this since the pandemic started. We've been, we've been kind of settled into this methodology. But you can see that our lines are really falling with 1,450 homes right on top of Decision Insights conservative analysis. Now, what I will tell you that's also important in the board making the decision is that if you ask the Decision Insight person, they would say, when you're building, you need to plan rooms for the moderate. And when you're staffing, you need to plan rooms for the conservative. We follow PDE's guidelines, which says your enrollment projection plus 10%, because the state does not want to, back when they were giving you money to build schools, they did not want you to build a school, build it too small, and then come back to them in five years when you still have 15 years left on a bond and say, oh, we didn't build it big enough. Now we want money from you again. And the, the state's answer when they were reimbursing was no, you got one shot to get it right for 20 years and we're going to give you a 10% leeway above your enrollment. So if you looked at the number that we were going to plan for, that we would recommend, we would give you our enrollment numbers plus 10%. So it really, you can see the green line is actually our enrollment plus, plus 10%. So the number of classrooms that we're saying that you should plan for based on 1,450 is really pretty close to just a little bit above um, what decision insight is. The other thing that factors in there, and, and now this is kind of like intuitive, but your schools are getting smaller and it's happening everywhere. The number of seats aren't going away, but the number of special needs students is increasing exponentially. And, and uh, those students absolutely deserve an education. Uh, they absolutely deserve to be here, but eight autistic students is the most you can put in a classroom. And those students, because of the apparatus and the curriculum and all the teaching strategies, require a full-size classroom. So often what happens is you would take a full-size classroom that would seat 25, and all of a sudden now it's seating eight. So you've lost, what, uh, 17 seats that you had for the general and public and uh, increasing ESL programs and, and autistic support. And there's, if you looked at your special education budget in any school district in Adams County over the past decade, you're just gonna see it go up astronomically with the, with the enrollment. So we're, um, you gotta kind of keep that in mind that eats away at that 10% future growth that you have. Um, if you go to the next slide, we broke it down. Um, here it is again, this is just K to three, and you can see our numbers, our lines are lining up right with their conservative. And what we would recommend would be right around what they were recommending for um, their uh, moderate projections. And then uh, and by the, with the green line being above the red line, the red line is the total number of seats that you have. The green line is the number of seats that you're anticipated to need to schedule that student population. So you can see that you're at 1262, but the projections are showing that you need another 200 and some odd seats in grades K to three. So it doesn't, it's just doesn't have enough classroom space based on these enrollments. If you go to the next one, um, four to six, um, you can see the green line is below the red line. So we're projecting that, you know, five years out, you have adequate space at uh, your four to six building. Your middle school and your high school, the middle school is the next slide. Uh, you've got plenty of room um, in, the, in the middle school. You should be planning for 767 and you have 934 seats uh, that are available total. And then um, in the high school, um, you uh, should be planning for 1,600 kids, 1,608 seats, um, and you have over 1,800 seats. 
So it's really not a question grades four to 12. Um, it's, it's pretty much lining up with, with what Decision Insight is providing to you. Again, with one, one thing that absolutely is critical, you gotta get that list of developments right because what we did was we said there were 1,450 uh, houses scheduled to be built. In the enrollment projections over the five years, there were 497 homes built. So over the next five years, you're projected to get 500 and some odd homes that are not considered in the enrollment projections. So then we layered in that delta, that difference between what had happened in the projections and what is anticipated to happen beyond what's in the projections. And then we rolled in those, those number of students each year. So I'll stop there and um, answer any questions that you have about our methodology and the numbers that we came up with. I don't have a question, but I want to thank you for making the screen larger so we can follow along with your presentation. Right. What's the ESL projections for the district? We don't have, I guess we could go back if we could get the records and you could, could look at your numbers. Um, we're the, at this level of study, these are really kind of like, these are big number kind of exploratories. So like, why couldn't say at the elementary schools, like the third grade, that were, yeah. why couldn't it be that grade be moved up to the CBIS? CBIS be moved to the middle school because we're, I feel like we're talking about relatively little numbers. Like it's not a huge spike. So why couldn't that be done? And then like the junior seniors have like split hybrid days. That's a district decision. Um, that's. We looked at a lot of grade configurations very early on, you know, and when we were punching the number with a one off grade, there wasn't enough capacity from when we were doing the initial math. So we were looking at if we move third grade to CBIS, for example, or sixth grade up to the middle school. There was even an option of CBIS just being two grade levels and the building was not even going to be close to, it was going to be underutilized, I believe. Correct. And then there were other scenarios of moving a grade level to the middle school, and then that was over capacity. Yeah, the goal is to get it as close to the capacity as possible. So the buildings are being used. That's the thing. We want our buildings to be used, but the numbers just didn't work no matter what transition we looked at. The other thing that I would mention um, is that I know, and, and we hear this a lot of times, this idea about development is like worrisome. Development is probably not your biggest worry. If you look at the existing homes held by older citizens who one day are heading to heaven or heading to Arizona or down to Florida or to a retirement community, um, those homes are turning over. You sold, on average, um, the past several years, you've been selling over 300 homes in the district. Almost half of, of the homes are selling in the 150 to 250 range. That's where, when you look, go back to that, oh, I'm sorry, turned it off. If you, if you look at the slide that has housing units, what you can see is all housing units and that includes 55 plus, it's literally every housing unit. But yet your enrollment over that same time still went up. So even though the number of housing units was increasing for older citizens, it wasn't increasing enough to offset the in-migration of students. And the, 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 um, the new house is really kind of like the icing on the cake. Houses that are existing that are being sold and changing hands 
are accounted for within the projections that are done with no development. And then the development is adding on top of that. And again, if you look at your growth rates over the five years leading to the pandemic, someone said, oh, that's not a very steep line. And it, it's not, it's like, you know, one, 2% a year, but it's, you know, it's 50 students, 50 students, 50 students, 50 students, was 125 over five years. If you add 125 students and your highest rate of incoming students are elementary kids, K to three, that's where you're going to get your, your push. So um, that's all, I mean, that's all kind of, um, that, that part is baked into what happened last year, what happened the year before, what's going to happen next year based on, based on those things. Thank you. So at this time, if the board has any comments or if you wanted to engage in any questions of commentary or direction. Okay, um, so I, I don't know the best way to say this. I think actually Dr. O'Brien um, kind of stole my thunder with um, the way you put it out there, um, which I'm grateful for actually, because I think the one thing that, um, and, and I know I'm speaking for me, I'm hoping that I kind of am speaking for the board as well, but um, the one thing that we want to make sure that most of you who haven't been here from the beginning, I know a few of you have been through this with us, um, but we did not set out to add another building. Um, that is just something, one of the things that we learned through COVID is what the disruption of the education to our students does to our students. Um, which is why when we started seeing how much these elementary schools, which of course you can see, are really the buildings that we have to concentrate on. Um, once we realized how much disruption some of this construction could entail for them is when we entertained the thought of a whole new building. Perhaps these are just too old to upgrade. Perhaps we need to look at something that is going to be more conducive to our future. Um, it's not written in stone. That's not definitely the direction we're going. It's just what we're looking at because of these projections that are just expected with no crystal ball. Um, you guys have said it perfectly. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know that um, these developments are actually gonna come to fruition. We don't know that people are gonna continue having kids or that you know when they get help having kids that they're not gonna end up with four instead of one. Um, we don't have a crystal ball for that. I think the one thing that we are trying to do is to share the information with you guys as we get it so that you understand where we're coming from as we make this decision, which is so difficult. Um, we are not looking to price anybody out of a home. We are not looking to raise taxes at all if we could help it. Um, the unfortunate part is the inflation that's hitting all of our pockets also hits our budget um, as a district. So please understand that every word that you guys have spoken to us, we have taken into consideration 100%. Um, we do not want to do more than we have to do, but we also want to make sure that what we do do takes us into the future so that you guys aren't all back here with us in 10 years. Does that mean a new school? I don't know. Um, I'm hoping we can do it without breaking the bank for any of us. I mean, that's my pocket too. So hopefully that helps. I'd like to add a little bit. Um, I heard today from several people that it's terrible that the school board is thinking about building a Taj Mahal. First place, I don't think that came out of anybody's words. Anybody's. If you look around at this school district, you won't see a Taj Mahal any place. We've built what was necessary to build over the years. You know, we really have. We just have not built the clan, the glamorous high end that other school districts in this area have built. Um, we're not looking to gouge anybody. I pay taxes. Eric does. Everybody does in the school district. We don't want any more taxes than necessary. We want to build what we need to do to raise our kids. 
You know, I don't have any kids in this school district right now, but I'm going to hang in here because this school board means a lot to me. And I think we've done the right thing for many years. You know, and, and we are up against it. And it's not our fault that inflation has hit us so hard. You know, this, this school, if we have to build a school where we put additions on, probably would have cost us half of this two years ago or three years ago. 50 million, maybe. You know, maybe not even then. But I'm just saying, we we don't. There's things that we don't have control of. We don't have control of our population. We can't go to our townships and say, "Hey, look, we're done with development. We don't have. We have to build another school because you're putting you're allowing another development to come." We don't have that option. We really don't. We can't do anything on that. The school board is dictated so much from the state and the Department of Education. You know, we have to build a building that's handicap accessible and, you know, everything's got to be so-so because it's a public school district. We can't be the lone. We can't build just whatever suits, you know. I'm just reaching out to you people that are, that are going around and saying that we're building the Taj Mahal. Well, first place, we have not voted on it yet. Nobody's voted on anything. Just want everybody to be aware of it. We're not. I, I just want to say thanks to Fred. I think um, I, I think he did a phenomenal job uh, for us and the public that's here tonight. I think he did. A, I think he explained it a lot differently and also countered in not, you know, a lot of the focus has been on the developments and what's upcoming, but we also have to remember the turnover of the existing homes was my development. The homes turned over very quickly, and that's a factor that, and they're all multi, they're all single family homes with potential, not, not a lot of retirees moving in. So I appreciate your time tonight. I appreciate you helping triangulate the other data that we received. I think that presentation to me, uh, already knowing it, really, I think explained it fairly well to everybody that's here. Thank you. It amazed me, the average single family detached home in this <laughs> district is on sale for eight days where it's sold. A townhouse or condo uh, is even on the market fewer days. It was like four. Um, so you've been kind of insulated from what's happened to us in Cumberland County, but I think as it's gotten uh, overdeveloped in Cumberland County, they're starting to push a little down towards this way or you got Baltimore, Washington people who are who are pushing up from the south, and uh, that's into your district. Okay, into keep, district. keep in mind, no, it's, 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 time, it's it's kind of the was the lowest tax district in Adams County. So we need to years. stop bragging that this is the best school district to move into. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to explain it. But the, the people before us didn't want to raise taxes, so they didn't do some of the things that were needed to be done years ago. We went through the same feasibility study when we built CBIS. I was on board then. Okay. They keep, people don't understand. We tried to be conservative as much as possible. We've gotten to the point where we've outgrown our conservative ways. We need to provide, and one of the, the biggest items that's been coming up, our special education has just grown over the last uh, five to 10 years to the point where people move into our district just for the facilities that we have been providing. So when those kind of things happen uh, and they come to the school board and say, hey, we're running out of room, and we're putting, we're putting people in closets to, to maintain uh, the, the privateness of the special education. That is wrong. I don't, and, and if you were sitting in my seat and said, why are we teaching, why are we teaching uh, kids in rooms that don't have a, a, you know, a window or, you know, proper ventilation, things like that. Things that we have, so to speak, we kick the can down the road. You can't kick it anymore. The can is, is too bent up. It won't even roll. So we're, we're trying to look at this, again, in a conservative way. If we can fix these buildings up, we will fix them up. If they are beyond the point that it's going to cost almost as much to fix them up as it is to put a new facility in, then that's what we need to decide. The other factor is 
if you displace students out of a building for two years till all construction is completed, that is a disruption that we just went through with COVID. And what we're finding out in a, in a, in a harsh way that those type of disruptions affect those children throughout their, their uh, school years, the rest of their school years. Uh, so we don't, we, that becomes part of our organization. So uh, these gentlemen here have given us all the facts. We're gonna to have to weigh, weigh them all. You've given us enough information from townships and things like that. And people are saying, we don't wanna raise taxes. Well, at some point, um, when we make a hard decision, at some point, somebody's gonna be sitting here 10 years from now thinking, well, oh, why didn't these people do this? Now we're making another hard decision that we need to just basically start over. So we don't want that to happen also. So we will, we will progress in a way that it's going to be beneficial for, for both students and the people that live in the community. And that's the best we can do. If we had that crystal ball, believe me, uh, I would use it and I would say, okay, everybody's going to be happy in 10 years. I don't know that that's possible. I just have two more real quick points since I start the microphone. The first was, because I like to talk, I'm just kidding. Um, the first point was that when we talked about the new school, um, we were not talking about just holding on to CPE or possibly even NOE. Um, those were factors that we would definitely be incorporated back into the budget. Um, CTE, as was said, is it's a valuable property to somebody. Um, not necessarily us, if we don't continue using it as a school. We do know, however, that it is very much a community school and that a lot of people in that area appreciate having it that close. Um, again, something that we are taking into consideration. The other thing that, um, and Anthony can speak directly to this, the first thing that I looked at him, I said, we don't want Taj Mahal, we don't want gold and platinum, we want brick and mortar, and that's it. You know, we need it to be functional. We're not looking for the the um, building that you see right out on 94 up there in Bermudian with their, you know, eight turf fields and their chandeliers. It's not what we're looking for, no matter what we do, whether it's an addition or, or a whole new construction. That's just not what we're about. I sat down. <laughs> Get it that way for me. I just can more. This gentleman has. Yes, sir. Okay. How about the Burns Township and the school district get together? Well, listen to this. When Joe Mary moves in to build 250 homes, there's a surcharge tax for the school. Fair <laughs> lot. We were told that's not possible. Well, I don't know. That's why I'm just facing that. Yeah. That way it would help offset the taxes and maybe help the elderly. And help you. I, I, I agree. Yeah, we looked into that. We were told we could do research. We have, we have no authority to, to make that happen. And again, as supervisors, we all appreciate the time you all put in there. We all know it's, it's a thankless job. I enjoyed what Fred said. I found that most, <clears throat> most helpful. I, I really sincerely think if we just get the accurate information on the developments, that's the most important thing. That's what I think we're all here just a little frustrated with. And I think you've heard that. And I think we're going to get that clarified. I really, really do. If you reach out to us, uh, I'm familiar with most of these townships and most of these developments. We can shed a lot of light on that so that we are making accurate decisions based on accurate information. That's all that we're looking for. Really, it is. You're holding a crystal ball, right? <laughs> You're hiding there's it. There's a lot of information out there. No, I hear you. I hear you. So much easier with this. Thank you, there. I appreciate that. No, Thanks. It seems like a logical idea. Sure. All right, thank you all. Uh, we appreciate the community coming out for yet another evening. Please know as you think. Send us your comments. We do have that link available. Uh, you can also use the um, public comment link that's attached to the board meeting. This is recorded. So you will be able to go back and look at those smaller numbers. 
and um, we'll be happy to provide any information that you're interested in. I do look forward to working with um, the township supervisors to gain even more information. Please contact me. Let's schedule a meeting as soon as possible. And um, I'm grateful for all of your input. Yes, sir. So when, when do you guys meet? I mean, I was in the dark. I, I'm here tonight to find out what's going on. I didn't know any of this. We have a study session the first Monday of every month, unless it's a holiday weekend, then it will be the second Monday of the month. That's our study session for our regularly scheduled board meeting the following Monday, which is the second Monday of every month. Uh, we have been undergoing feasibility studies since June 2021. Yes, all of the uh, presentations are on the website. So don't feel like you've been left behind. You can catch up. Yes, it's under the About Us tab on our district website, Feasibility Study. All of the information, all of the presentations from Crabtree Warbar are there. You can see the journey that we've taken and how the information has changed, how the options have changed. And we've been at this for a long time. This has been a year and a half long process. Uh, we're still working through it. We're getting a little bit closer to that decision, though. And that's the time to bring our community in to hear the questions, to hear the concerns so the board is as informed as possible um, to make this very difficult future decision. And you see all the data, but I hopefully what I shared is kind of the why, why it has morphed um, to from what we started with to what we're looking at as options now. Actually, what we're going to do, folks, we're going to end this end of the feasibility study. We still have our study session to go through, yes. but we're, we're trying to be cognizant of the gentlemen that are sitting here so that, uh, you know, if we're going to move on to the rest of our study yes. session and we're going to allow these judges to. Great. Thank uh, you both. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Township, thank you very much for everybody. Yeah. Uh, please, thank you very much. Thank you so much.